Aloha. I'm Dan Leaf. I go by Fig, and this is Figment's The Power of Imagination. You knew that because you tuned in to watch it, but I'm glad you did, and I thank Think Tech Hawaii for allowing me to share this with you and my other show, Figments on Reality. Now, before we get started, let me talk a little bit about what I'd like to talk about here, and Figments is uh, intended to entertain and inspire. There are no politics. There's no news here, but I've got a lot of friends who can tell you how their goals became reality because Figments has kind of a, a negative connotation. It's kind of fanciful, something never realized. So uh, they are also the basis for every great thing that happens, uh, that every goal that people live out. My guest today is somebody who's lived a dream, and his dream was to fly and fly and fly and fly. So let me welcome Lieutenant Colonel, retired U.S. Air Force, Greg Slick Aguirre. Aloha, Slick. How you doing? Uh, doing great, Fig. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to become a uh, figment today. <laughs> well, you've got a heck of a figment. A great story. And it's always great to connect with you. We first knew each other at Luke Air Force Base, Arizona, where we're both flying the beautiful F-15 Eagle. And, and that's how I... I thought of Slick mostly, but there's much more to his story, and uh, Slick, I'm really glad you'll share it with us. Uh, we've got a nice picture of you in the cockpit of the F-15 here that I think we'll show, and um, that's that's you in the mighty beast of the Eagle. Uh, you flew the F-15 a lot. How many hours did you wind up with? Oh, well, somewhere above 1,900, but I don't know the exact number because I never wanted to know the exact number. I really? knew I wanted to be the first guy to do uh, 3,000 hours, so yeah. 2,900. Uh, yeah, 2,900. That's yeah, what I yeah, I wanted to be the first guy to 3,000 hours, and I was really hustling, uh, and I I didn't make it. I I didn't want to know by how much I missed it, so I never uh, really got yeah, the exact I, numbers, but I was to a, move on to another career. I was a thousand hours behind you, but um, I do remember 1931.9. Uh, and then I went and flew the Viper, as you know, but you got a lot more hours than that. You've flown different airplanes, 27,000 plus hours. Well, we'll talk actually, more about actually, figure we got to be accurate. It's like somewhere north of 25,000. Okay. For that's still a lot. I mean, that's a <laughs> lot of flying. I'm, I can't do math or I'd figure out days, months, however, how long it is in the cockpit, there, that, in various cockpits. That, that may be more time in the air than a lot of birds, actually. A good point. And you were, um, you were well known in the F-15 community um, because you were the first second lieutenant to fly, the solo of the F-15. You had four second lieutenants and two captains in your class and you're well recognized kind of as the face legal, but through the luck of timing, you did become the first second lieutenant in the United States Air Force to fly the then new F-15 Eagle by yourself. Yeah, and it, um, it actually got me on the front page of the Air Force Times. It's been downhill. Did it really? Since. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but no, yeah, it just happened to work. Somewhere there? Yeah. yeah, and it just happened to work out that I... Um, I ended up flying the, the first solo hop, and it was very high visibility. The Air Force had just gotten their brand was. new Eagles, and um, they were monitoring our grades and progress very closely. Um, so I went out and flew my, my ride with the chase, came back to the pattern, and as I looked down at the R RSU, the mobile, there was a- The little small control tower at a training base they have to watch us students closely. Exactly. Yeah. What well, was like a blue steely parking lot? That's what the colonels drove around in those days. And they no were all government vehicles, usually watching crappy the, cars. <laughs> the second lieutenant solo with their eagle. And so I knew I really had to do a good job. So about the second one, um, I made a low approach. And, and of course, you were only allowed in a single seater to make low approach. But you could come down just so close as to not touch your wheel. Uh, yeah, one no inch touching goes, fine. folks. That was just a rule. You couldn't exactly touch the wheels to the ground until you landed. And I did good. such a good job that I kissed the tires on there. But 
and actually did a touch and go. But nobody gave me any grief over it. No good. Very memorable. I things. still I still think the F-15 was the easiest airplane I've ever flown to land well. I mean, most of them are designed to be pretty landable, but you could properly flown, you could land the F-15 very nicely. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, and just uh I remember the last landing I made in after flying it for 15 years. It was uh I was able to even make a really good landing with tears in my eyes because I was going to miss that jet. Yeah, I remember that flight. I was honored to be your wingman, and you, uh, you just you uh, went up against a couple of F-15s and clubbed them were like or F-16s, but flown by instructor pilots, and you clubbed them like they were baby seals. Okay, I know I'm going to get some nasty emails about that, but it was well, uh, and and so did you, Fig. I kept that video. And I yeah. watch it now because it's pretty inspirational. We got some good film that day. We did. It, it was fun. <laughs> and um, one of the, well, it, it, I could go on and on about that, <laughs> but there's much more to say because in your 2,900 plus hours, uh, you flew kind of the standard training environments that we flew in at our operational bases. But you also went up to Keflavik and flew in Iceland intercepting the venerable, even then, Bear Bomber, right? Uh, yes, yeah, I was there in 1986. It was actually the transition uh, from mm -hmm. the F-4 to the Eagle. When I first got there, it was an F-4 squadron with just a couple of Eagles in it. Um, and our mission was to intercept any Soviet aircraft that intruded on Icelandic airspace. Um, well, this sounds pretty boring, and supposed to doing a dogfight against another F-15 or an F-16, was it boring flying, intercepting a big old bomber? No, it was actually <laughs> really kind of a kick, because um, here you are, you, you've gone, you know, and it's just like in the movies, you race up the ladder, jump in the jet, get it started, mm -hmm. blast out the alert barn, go right into burner on the high-speed uh, taxiway and onto the runway. And now you're you're headed out sometimes 600 miles to get from Keflavik to intercept a TU-95 Bear Bomber. Usually there are two of them. And over uh, over the North Atlantic, which if you've ever flown a single seat fighter over the North Atlantic, it's pretty foreboding. Yeah, at night, it, lots of weather, and um, the pressure was on because once AWACS committed us, uh, the air, we airborne did radar come, airplane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. If, if AWACS, once they committed us, if we didn't um, complete the intercept, it was briefed at the JCS level. So um, you didn't want to go up and miss that intercept. Um, and it's such high visibility that I've got a picture here uh, that was taken from your airplane, the two-seater, with a phot photographer in the back mm -hmm. seat. And um, first of all, it's a beautiful picture of two beautiful airplanes and a bomber. So I may be biased. But uh, that picture's in the Smithsonian, right? Yes, it is. It's um, normally we didn't get this this high quality of pictures, but this was a mm -hmm. special mission. Actually, I said we set up on alert with with three alert aircraft, and I had a two seater and had the um, a photographer that was a contract photographer from Donald Douglas, who was a manufacturer of the jet at the time. Yep. And we got very lucky. Sometimes you could set up an alert and not get scrambled for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. He got his cameras in the jet and we went into the alert barn. Let's get a cup of coffee. <clears throat> Horn goes off. And we went on a beautiful day and intercepted uh, two bear deltas. Uh, it's a maritime surveillance um, mm -hmm. version of the aircraft. And um, as you can see, the pictures just came out spectacular. I'm sure the bear was wondering, why are three eagles yeah. joining on my wing? And you could see a lot of camera lenses uh, in, in the gunners. Uh, Pointing the other way. Exactly. Yeah, and you told me and when we dis discussed this ahead of time, because this is a mission I never flew in the F-15, you told me that there was actually sort of a mutual cooperation between the bear crews and the eagle pilots. And uh, for example, when you'd be photographing the sonar buoy, Bay. Would you share that with our viewers? Yes. Um, one of the variants that we intercepted um, was a bear foxtrot. Now, a foxtrot has a magnetic azimuth detector, a mad boom, mm -hmm. on the back of its tail, and it flies down very low and is a sub chaser. 
Well, flying down low, now that sort of ratchets up the fun quotient of the mission. Um, and the yeah. Bear was a very impressive aircraft down low. Um, amazingly, with those turboprop air, um, engines, they could still do 400 knots. That's and, incredible. Yeah, they That's were really incredible. That's it really better is. than World War II fighters. And you could actually fly forward on their wing line. So you got in line with the props with your aircraft and you could feel the vibration in your cockpit. You could just, your cockpit would vibrate from the vibration. Well, imagine what it was like in their cockpit. Oh, it, once in a while they'd come <laughs> up on the radio and it sounded like, uh, in the background. Yeah. Um, but so now if a bear fox trots down low, he's down there to do his mission, mission which is chasing submarines. Now the intel, um, specialists really wanted pictures of in the sauna buoy of the bear. Um, mm -hmm. So what we would do is we'd drop down below the bear on kind of an angle when the sauna buoy bays came open. They're like bomb bays on the aircraft. Mm -hmm. And of course, if they're open and he's down low, it's because he's getting ready to drop. So he didn't want to be up right underneath them. And if you got the correct angle, you could actually get pictures in the sauna buoy bay. The bears actually kind of took care of us because sometimes you'd be underneath the bear um, and kind of jockeying for position trying to get that photo and if he kind of gave you a gentle wing rock that was hey watch out buddy i'm getting ready to pickle these, these sauna buoys so gentle wing rock and then pew, 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 and the sauna buoys would come out so yeah we, they were very friendly encounters there we could use that uh, with yeah. the current russian air force because it's not like that so anyway that's pretty awesome and it the this whole story uh, sort of tells me that you were born to fly but it wasn't that simple and when you soloed in the in the f-15 as the first second lieutenant, lowest officer rank for you non-military viewers uh a butter bar a new kid you already had 48 air medals that you'd received flying hueys in vietnam and that's a lot of air medals. Ten is a lot of air medals. Um, so that that's really how your flying started. You wound up in the army um, as a Huey pilot, and mm -hmm. uh, you wanted to fly, but that was the path. Why was why was the army the path? Why didn't you just go right into the air force or fly for the airlines, which you did later? Well, I, I, well, I graduated from high school, and you know, I I got good grades, but nothing good enough to get me into uh, college. Um, so this was kind of a fortuitous encounter with one of my friends because I, I was just talking to him going, you know, if I don't do something, I'm going to get drafted. This is mm -hmm. 1968. So um, I, this friend of mine said, um, well, why don't you do like Vinny Zappini did? Uh, Vinny joined the Army to be a pilot. And I went, no, 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 I know about these things. You've <laughs> got to have college to be a military pilot. And fortunately, my friend was very insistent. He goes, no, Vinny went in the Army to be a pilot. He told me that. I went, huh. Next day, I was down at the Army recruiter. I uh, walked in the front door. It was kind of a long hall. And on the left was the Air Force recruiter. And I thought, eh, maybe I'll ask the Air Force recruiter first. You know, this is like 10 of 68. It just happened yeah. a while back. And yeah. I was kind of going, well, I'd sure rather be in the Air Force. So I went in and talked to the... Uh, Air Force recruiter, and that was a very quick conversation. I said, well, I'd join the Army if I could be, or Air Force if I could be a pilot. And he goes, I hit the road, kid. But that Army recruiter down the hallway will talk. Yes, I went, oh, now encouraged, I continued down the hallway, kind of saw the, you know, the recruiting um, posters on the wall, and they're saying, be an Army aviator, Army aviation. So I opened the door into the recruiting office and said, uh, well, Sergeant, uh, I joined the Army if I could get into aviation. And, and he says, well, what do you want to do, son? Fly them or fix them? I said, well, I want to fly them. Well, my gosh. Because he didn't even bother talking to me. He just opened his drawer, gave me an intelligence test, and said, go take this test in that little room over there. It was a little more in a closet. Yeah. And then bring it back. And then, and then he'd spend some time talking with me and told me the program. And it all and kind, of, kind of evolved from there. And so you joined the Army to be a pilot. Were you guaranteed you were going to get to flight school or was there some uncertainty? Because you had to go to basic training and infantry training and become a soldier and then become a pilot, right? 
Yeah, there was a, there was sort of a catch in a sense because you are guaranteed it. But, you know, of course, you ask the recruiter, well, what happens to me if, you know, maybe I don't make it through? He goes, oh, we'll just treat you like a draftee and you only have to stay in 18 months. Uh -huh. um, doesn't sound too bad at all. Well, you, you do go through infantry basic training, um, throwing hand grenades, carrying a rifle as an E1. And um, when you graduate, then you go to pilot training. Now, if it doesn't work out so good for you and you go, well, and you had to solo within 17 hours. That was a hard number, 17 okay, hours. So you had to be able, good enough as a helicopter pilot to fly by yourself with 17 hours of flying, right? Exactly. And if you yeah. didn't cut it, well, guess what? You'd already had eight weeks of infantry training. You got back on the bus, went back to Fort Polk for eight more weeks of mm. infantry training and went to Vietnam with a rifle. And on one occasion, I saw one of the guys that had been in my class loading in my aircraft. Oh, wow. With, with his rifle. With his rifle. So that's uh, incredible. You're 18 when you joined the Army. You're a 19-year-old helicopter pilot in Vietnam. In fact, you told me that you were a 19-year-old aircraft commander flying in combat. And I know you're very modest, and I respect that that's part of you and I, and I respect that very much but we've got a picture here that you and i've talked about that we'll, we'll just call one minute out and you actually took this picture from your huey and please take some time and describe that whole scene for me as you did remember you remember folks slick is a 19 year old young man flying the second huey into target area so go ahead slick yeah, um, this yeah, this I took this picture in the fall of 1969, and um, the missions that we flew were in support of the infantry. Mm -hmm. I, and you're going to hear me call them grunts because, and I say that with the utmost respect. Absolutely. Our mission was to support the grunts any way we could, and it boiled down into insertions or combat assaults. Um, they'd operate in an area, and then we'd extract them, and that was an extraction. And then while they were operating in an area, we'd do resupplies and keep them with, you know, with sea rations, water maybe, um, ammunition. Um, so this picture is a picture of a combat assault. Um, I call it one minute out because we're, I, we're one minute out, and I can tell by the white phosphorus detonation that's the mm -hmm. left up. Now, where we're actually landing is that, that gray area out in front. And that's gray from, from the artillery prep because we have several artillery batteries lobbing 155 and 105 um, HE rounds, high explosive rounds into that landing zone. And the intent is to make the enemy keep their heads down because the helicopters are really very vulnerable. Right. So, what would, so, the, so this artillery is getting lobbed in there. And then at one minute out, the artillery battery would fire that white phosphorus off the LZ because it's already obscured enough by the mm -hmm. high explosive already. And that would tell us that the tubes were clear. No more artillery rounds were going You weren't going to get hit by your own cannon shells. Because we, yeah, Which one is important. artillery round would, would kill us all. Yeah. So now overhead are Cobra gunships. And you can see, if you look closely in the picture, just to the left and low of, of our flight, and actually I'm number three, there's, there's two okay. in front of us. Um, wow. You see that little poof of white in the tree? Mm -hmm. Treetops. That's from a Cobra gunship lobbing 2.75 artillery, or uh, holding fin aerial rockets. So 2.75 rockets along our approach axis. Mm -hmm. And then love putting minigun fire, which is machine gun fire, and a very high volume ray along our approach axis until we touch down in that LZ. And then now we've got grunts that are getting off that aircraft and all that, that fire um, uh, stops. So uh, they're really, they're clearing a corridor, trying their best to suppress fire underneath you so you don't get shot down. Exactly. And I tell you, and so each aircraft has. Four crew members in it, two pilots, two crew chief, two gunners, mm -hmm. and five grunts on board. And we're all wondering whether we're going to be alive in five minutes. Just Man. never knew. Yeah. Yeah. One in minute. In fact, I kind of get, get the adrenaline just kind of gets yeah. going. 
a little bit describing it. Yeah, that's that picture. And, and we did. I did this hundreds of times. It was it was a it was part of our mission, and I flew nearly thirteen hundred hours, twelve hundred eighty four point six to be uh, in a year comfortable rounding it up. So I did this a lot. Yeah. Wow. Well. Um, wow. I'll just leave it at that, and uh, uh, and we'll talk about your other flying. But that's a, a better description of flying the Huey in Vietnam, I think, than I've ever heard. So let's take a quick breath here, folks. Let your chicken skin subside, as we say in Hawaii, and talk about uh, Figment's on reality is every other week. And I thank ThinkTech, our sponsor for uh, that. You'll see us a week from today at 10 o'clock Hawaii Standard Time in the morning. Uh, and I think that's 4 p.m. on the East Coast. You do the math. I'm not good at math. But both shows are brought to you by ThinkTech Hawaii, a nonprofit corporation that can use your support. Please go to their website and think about uh, donating to them. So um, 1,900 hours in a year. So we said nine? No, no. 1,284. 12, 12, I call it 1,300. Yeah. Ooh, rounding up. Man, that's a boatload. And you're not tired of the Huey because you still fly it. Yes, I uh, I feel blessed. Um, I fly. I work for a company, um, Dillon Arrow. We manufacture the M134 minigun, which is the same armament that was on the Cobras and when I was in Vietnam. Um, yep. And we have a, a UH-1H, which is the same model of Huey I flew in Vietnam. So 53 later years later, I'm still a current Huey pilot. Yeah, and 53 years later, you still look 19, and I'm kind of <laughs> angry about that because I know you're actually three years older than me, but whatever you know that's genetics or something it's a great picture and i got to go fly with you not in that airplane uh but you uh told me once that your goal is to fly something every day yeah and i i haven't been able to quite do that um because um a lot of the flying we do not do now is mission oriented but yeah you know i if I don't fly, it's kind of like exercise. You go, well, I didn't fly today. And you're kind of yeah, aware of it. And you go, well, I'll just have to make up for that later. <laughs> do more reps the next day. You did a bunch of reps with Southwest Airlines in the 737, like 20 years of reps. Yes. Um, yeah, after um, I didn't quite make it to uh, 3,000 hours in the Eagle, but it was worthwhile not making it to be at Southwest. Yeah. It was absolutely... Right. A wonderful company. The culture was um, was so friendly and helpful um, that I I actually I really miss working there to this day. Um, and my timing there was spectacular. I was a first officer for only about three years, and then the company um, absorbed more mm -hmm. Yeah, and grew very quickly. And so most of the time I was there, I was a captain. And I found I found airline flying very rewarding. I enjoyed. The, the company, the first officers, the flight attendants, and the crews, and the way we we pulled together as a team, it was uh, it was a just a wonderful experience. Well, I really, you know, the one thing every time we talk that I take away from it is you just love to fly, and there are different kinds of flying, and you find what you love about it. You did have a pretty interesting on the ground experience with Southwest. Uh, that you told me about. Can we give that a quick one minute once over just so people yeah, know this, what can happen? Yeah, I had some unusual experiences at Southwest, um, things that other captains were going, you got to be kidding me. And one of those was one night, uh, one evening, actually, I was taxing out from um, Salt Lake City going to Spokane, beautiful evening in the summer. Um, I'm a new captain. And um, I get a, got a call from the flight attendant. Says, "Well, you know, we have a a passenger in the back who says he's violently ill and needs to go back to the terminal." I said, "Well, I'm not going to argue with violently ill. Go ahead and get some symptoms. Uh, we'll have medical attention waiting for him, and we're taking him back." Very simple huh? enough. Yeah, exactly. So, meanwhile, fortunately, I'm going pretty slow because there's high demand for the gates. So I'm calling ops. Meanwhile, another jet has actually taken the gate and pushed mm -hmm. back on. So I'm taxiing fairly slow while the ops is going, well, which gate can we send them to now? Um, well, and short, so shortly after I'm kind of working the gate, um, there's the flight attendant calls again and says, well, he says he's okay now and that we can, we can continue. And I said, no, can't cry wolf like that. 
he says he's feeling bad yeah. and we're already turned the aircraft back. We're, we're going back to the gate. So she says, okay. And so the next thing that happens and just kind of in an instant is I kind of feel the aircraft kind of clunk from the forward entry door opening, a little bit of pressurization change. And then I hear the flight attendant screaming, oh God, <laughs> he jumped, he jumped. Oh, oh my gosh. Well, I just, all I could think of was I better shut the engines down right now because I can't yeah, oh, see yeah. I don't know where he's going. Right. Um, I mean, he could get sucked up by an, an, air, an engine and that would impact the profit share. So uh, yeah, I, among other I, things, I stop cocked the engine and engines and now the aircraft just goes blank. Well, meanwhile, he's apprehended by the rampers who saw this happen. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the aircraft is now dark. So I'm thinking in my new captainhood that this is one of those times when the captain should go back and talk to the passenger. And, and so, look, I'm going to, I'm going to cut the story. I know there's much more to it, but I know I'm watching the clock. But I think this is one of the times where later, because of what you did as a captain, you got some appreciation from the passengers. And you mentioned that a couple of times. That's so got to feel pretty good when you get a round of applause from the people who trust you with your life. Well, yeah, it basically as it worked out, um, you know, I told them that uh, that we had a demented passenger uh, jump <laughs> off the aircraft. And but we're going to take you back to the jetway. Well, they applauded. And we did all the right things. And half an hour later, they all got back on the jet and we proceeded to Spokane. So I'll cut the yeah. short story short. Yep. Too. There's more yeah, to well, it. Well, there, I mean, there's so many stories that I'm already going to flex to plan B, which you and I discussed. And I'm going to ask you to come back at a later date because we haven't talked about the flying you do in the Huey, the PC-7 and other airplanes for Dylan. We haven't talked about your beautiful Chinese built trainer, Chinese trainer that I've flown in that is really a nice airplane. And um, so we're going to have to come back and tell more flying stories. Are you, are you up for that? Oh, gee, I have to tell more flying stories. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, and there maybe, are, there are. That, yeah. that half of this, this half an hour has literally flown by. <laughs> yeah, literally <laughs> flown by. So I will, I do have to ask you now, because this was a figment, this idea that you were going to fly was a figment, something you wanted to do. Your first airplane flight was on a on the flight to Army training, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And you turned it into a dream that you haven't lost. So what's your current dream, flying related or other? Do you have something that at age 71, I can say that because I'm right behind you, uh, that, that's next or that's you know, something in the back of your mind? Well, um, actually, I have recently discovered um, I got a Wrangler Jeep <laughs> because <laughs> um, I, I, I had I, the realization hit me that I've been all over Arizona, all over the United States, and yeah. I've seen a whole lot of it from the air. So I thought, man, because I'm going to start going down some roads and exploring on some of my days off and seeing the things up close that. Maybe I've, I've seen from awesome. the air and I'm seeing them from the ground. And so, Jeep, um, yeah. so, so that, that's kind of being woven into the, the retirement plan. Yeah, neither Jeep nor Southwest Airlines have compensated us for these plugs that we've given them. Or McDonnell <laughs> Douglas, a now defunct company, but uh, cool. And so thanks, Slick. We'll, we'll get you back on sometime soon as, uh, and continue the conversation on on all of this and I'm flying and, and I hope to get out to Arizona, see you, uh, just see you and Betsy, but also because you said you'd take me flying again. So, you know, I'm up for that. Oh, yeah. um, we'll so get, we'll man, put some G's on. we'll put some awesome. G's on your body. That is a very rapid fire flew by episode of figments. Uh, and I will close with what would fig do? What Fig would like to do and learn from this is uh, not just follow my dream, but find something good in everything you do, because that's that's slick. That's Greg Aguirre, and um, he's an inspiration to me. I hope he has been to you. So next week, Figments on Reality commentary, and then the following uh, week, uh, back to Figments, the power of imagination with Honey. I bought a race car. So tune in next time. Please give me feedback, show ideas, whatever else you'd like to share at info at phase minus one dot com. Aloha. <laughs>